So last week we, we kicked off a new sermon series on the book of Jonah, where we're looking at this prophet named Jonah and his journey with following God and not wanting to follow God and all the decisions that he made um, and trying to figure out, well, what does that mean for us today? And I thought Pastor Tim left us with an excellent challenge last week when he asked us to make sure that we are running the right race and not just running the race that we want to run. Because we saw very early on that as Jonah receives a word from God, go tell the Ninevites what I have for them, Jonah says, no, thank you. I don't like the Ninevites very much. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And so we followed his story as he got on a boat, took a nap, which sounds awesome to me. It's a rainy day. Um, but then he gets woken up by the crew of the ship because there's a great storm that's come upon them. And they've figured out this is because of Jonah. So they wake him up and uh, he tells them, yeah, I'm running from God. And the only way that you're going to escape from this storm is if you throw me overboard. Well, they try and row back and it, it didn't work. The storm that God has created is so strong that they can't do anything. And so they finally gave in and they threw Jonah into the ocean. God provided a great fish, which I will probably call a whale several times. But I just want you to know that I know it's a fish. I just grew up hearing it as Jonah in the whale, and so it's beaten into my head. But this giant fish swallows Jonah, and we're left with this story of these sailors as they have just seen the power of God and now his mercy. And they offer sacrifices and make vows to the Lord. And we're left kind of to wonder what's going on with Jonah. And we're actually not given a whole lot of details of what was going on inside this giant fish as Jonah's in there. But we have this beautiful prayer in chapter 2. And so we're going to look at that this morning. So Jonah chapter 2, starting with verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord. And he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and your breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. The roots of the mountains sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you... Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Did you see how specific Jonah's prayers were? The descriptive language that he used? I don't know about you, but I don't really pray that way to God very often. But as I've been looking at this all week and reading this over and over and over again. It reminded me of being a kid, and I'd get home from school, and my mom would ask me, how was your day? And I would say, fine, every single time, just fine. I wouldn't tell her if something bad happened, wouldn't tell her if something good happened. It was just fine. I know it drove my mother crazy, because she wanted to know what was going on in my life. And I believe that our Father in heaven also wants to know what's going on in our lives. And he wants to know how you feel about what's going on. Yes, he already knows. And yet he is inviting you into conversation and he wants you to tell him how you feel about things. He wants to hear your cries. He wants to hear your celebrations. And so we have this, just this beautiful prayer by Jonah with all this descriptive language. And I think there's something there for us to learn. I think it could change the way some of us pray. I know it's impacting me. Um, but what I wish was in here 
is some of Jonah's prayers before he realized that this giant fish was part of God's salvation plan for him. Because I wonder what those prayers might have sounded like. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you pray with other people, if they're praying honestly, you begin to understand who they are. Prayer is very intimate when we're honest about it. I think that's why some of us don't really like to pray together. Because we know that our hearts, if we're honest, are going to be exposed. You're putting yourself in a very vulnerable situation. And it can be a little nerve-wracking sometimes. My very first uh, year of marriage, we were at my in-law's house for Christmas Eve. This has been our tradition whenever possible. We go to my in-law's house for Christmas Eve, and then we'll drive across New York State and go to my parents' house in central New York. Well, this first time we're ever doing this, we get in the car, we're driving, we've got to get gas, so we get off the highway. As we're about to get back on the highway after filling up, the transmission light comes on our vehicle, and the car stalls. And I'm just absolutely frustrated. We're at a stoplight. I got to wave people around so I can figure out what's going on. And I, I did what probably some of you guys do. I turned the car off and turned it back on, hoping the problem would be fixed. And it started right up. So on to the highway we go. Now, as the car has stalled, I start praying. But it wasn't to God. Really, I'm praying to the car, telling it how awful it is, that it needs to get its act together, it needs to figure itself out. Um, and as we're driving down the highway, the light comes on again, and I'm getting more frustrated. I want to get rid of this car. I want to drive it into a dumpster and light it on, a fire and, on fire and be done with it. I'm sick of this car. But, you know, I obviously have to get to our destination. Well, so we're, we're driving, and then all of a sudden, every light on the dashboard lights up. It's making all sorts of noise. And wouldn't you know, as we pulled over, smoke starts billowing out of the hood of the car. It was on fire. And I've watched a lot of action movies. So I know that when a car is on fire, it's about to explode. So I tell Anna to get out of the car and we are running away from this car as fast as we can. Because any second now, it's going to explode. And I know that the explosion is going to blow us forward. We're going to have to do some sort of somersault to save our lives or something like that. And so we're running and I see this car driving past us and he pulls over behind us and he's getting closer and closer to our car. So now I got to save this guy because he's going towards the car that's about to explode. Well, he pops out of the vehicle. He goes, you've got three minutes to get everything out of your car. Thankfully, this guy is a volunteer firefighter and he knows exactly how much time we have to get everything out of our car and that it's not gonna actually explode because that only happens in the movies. Somebody going on the other side of the highway had seen what was going on and called 911, so the fire department showed up very quickly. The car was a total loss, but we were able to get everything out of it. While we're waiting to sort things out, another person stops. It's another young man, and he asked what happened and if we're okay, uh, and he asked where we were going, and so I tell him, and it turns out he's going within 15 minutes of where my parents live. God has set up this miraculous rescue plan for us. And so now my prayers have turned from cursing the car, which I didn't think was actually going to listen to me, to praising God for his rescue of us. See, when we pray honestly, there's a lot that we can learn about ourselves. And I don't talk about this so you can listen to somebody else pray and decide what's going on for them or to judge them for your prayers, but as a, as a model of self-reflection to find out what is going on within my heart, God. The words that I'm saying to you, what does it reveal to me about myself and my relationship with you? Now, Jonah does something very interesting in his prayers. Let me take you to verse 2 again. In my distress... I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep within the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. Now let's look at Psalm 30 verse 3. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Let's look at verse 3. 
You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of our seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over, over me. Psalm 42 verse 7 says, Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and your breakers have swept over me. Now those two, it's a little bit easier to see how similar those are. Let's look at verse 5. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. And Psalm 69, 1 through 2 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths. Where there is no foothold, I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I've got one more for you. Verse 9, Jonah says, But I, with sounds of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And Psalm 66, 13 and 14 says, I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you, vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. And so Jonah is taking the timeless words of God and he's praying them back to God. Now, in case you think that I just made all those connections, this has been written about over and over again throughout church history people have made the connections between what Jonah is praying and the Psalms. There's actually a few more in there, um, but I figure you can get the, the, the picture at this point. Jonah probably grew up hearing these Psalms sung over and over again in the temple, in festivals, community gatherings, and then in his own home probably. He probably has a lot of the Psalms memorized. And so what I believe is happening in this time where we don't really know what's going on with Jonah, because we just have this small little prayer. He's in the, the fish for three days, and this is all we get. It's just these few verses. But I'm sure you've been in situations where something's going on in your life, and a verse pops into your mind. This is one of the primary ways that God speaks to us through his word and he brings it back to us. And it's a beautiful opportunity to pray it back. When I don't know what to pray, I go to the scriptures. Or I go to other people's prayers. I have a whole collection of prayer books on my bookshelf because there's so many times where I don't know what to pray and I need to lean on someone else. And the scripture is a beautiful way to do that. And so as God brings scripture to your mind, whether it's a joyous situation or a heartbreaking situation, we encourage you, just pray those back to God. You don't have to know everything that's going on. In fact, as I was doing my research into these Psalms, I had this moment where I was like, Jonah, you took every single one of these scriptures out of context. Not a single one of these is about being swallowed by a fish. In fact, a lot of them are... so. Uh, one of them is about um, being saved from their enemies. Jonah is his biggest enemy. Right? He's actually acting like an enemy of God when this all happens. So that's out of context. There's one for the dedication of the temple. One of these psalms was where, where David is, is running from his enemies and he's crying out to God for help. But all of them have this, this theme of salvation. I don't know if anybody's ever said to you as you're excited about something God's sharing with you, well, that's actually out of context. It's always a very deflating moment. It can be very painful. Um, while I was in conversations with a, a gentleman about possibly joining uh, his ministry, he was telling me all about it. And I, I just felt like there was something in this moment. And I said to him, can I can I just bless you with this verse that's coming to mind right now? And so I quoted him Habakkuk 1.5. Look to the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe even if you were told. And that became, I ended up joining the ministry partly because of that moment where God's timeless word was very timely. And we were going to different churches talking about what was, what was going to go on. And one time he had me get up and share before the whole congregation read this verse. 
And afterwards, somebody came up to me and they said, Brian, that's all nice and good and stuff, but you took that verse completely out of context. I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> this feels great um, being called out here. But actually, in terms of that verse, it's repeated again in the book of Acts. And it's used to talk about people who didn't have faith for God to do big things. Even in the book of Acts, in that moment, God's timeless word back in the book of Habakkuk, within the context that it was written for a very specific reason, God was about to raise up the Babylonians and the prophet was going to be blown away that that was going to be God's tool to get his people back on track. But yet, in the book of Acts, we see that word become timely. And again, in this moment with this gentleman, God's word, his timeless word was becoming timely. But because of that conversation, I went back and I did a bunch of research and began to, to really dig into what the context of that was. Because God gives us context within the scripture so that we can have conversation with him where we can continue to go deeper. And we see that played out in this prayer. I'm sure as Jonah is, is laying there inside the fish, unable to, to move, just squirming around a little bit, giving the fish an awful stomach ache, that God is bringing to mind these scriptures that Jonah grew up hearing. And then he finds this theme of salvation and he prays it back to God. And it's, a, it's a, a prayer of thanksgiving. It's this, this beautiful prayer, thanking God for what he has done. And yet, I was still really struggling with this most of this week. Pastor Tim was gracious enough last week to share with us his frustrations with Jonah and the troubles with looking at this man who is supposed to be called by God and his decisions. And I got to tell you, that just stirred up in me this week. It's like, God, what do you have for us in this? Because right now, in this moment, I don't like this guy very much. And I think it's because he reminds me of me. 27 times in this prayer, Jonah references himself. I was looking at uh, the new English translation this week. I've never read anything out of there before. I really liked it. Um, but I found it interesting. The translators made a translation note saying that he talked about himself 27 times. I thought that's usually a translation note says something about like, well, in the original language, this is what it means literally. But here they just wanted me to know that 27 times Jonah was talking about himself. It was a big deal to them. And I was like, that's interesting. I wonder how many times when I'm praying, am I only talking about myself and I'm not talking to God about him? I want him to know everything that's going on in my life. But do I actually stop to listen to God? Do I stop to hear what he is saying to me? Do I just tell him how awesome I think he is? You know, that's how we start off most of our prayer meetings on Sunday mornings is we just spend some time praising God, aligning our hearts with his. And it leads into all sorts of other beautiful prayers. But Jonah seems to me, especially within the context of what he has done, running away from God, and now he's kind of trapped by God in the fish, he's still talking about himself a lot. I mean, he starts off the psalm, I called and you answered, you rescued me. Which, by the way, is a great prayer. In fact, that theme of us calling to God and him rescuing runs throughout the entire Bible. It's in the Psalms, it's in Isaiah, it's in Jonah, and even on into the New Testament. In the book of Acts, there's a verse that says, it shall come to pass that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul also writes in the book of Romans, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a theme that if we call on the Lord, he is faithful to save. But then he just goes on and keeps talking about himself. I'd like to challenge you this morning. 
as you're praying, would you make note of how often that you're just talking about yourself? And again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying ignore yourself. I'm not saying don't bring your needs and your concerns to God. In the Lord's Prayer, we are told to ask for our daily bread. We're told to ask for what we need. We're told to ask for forgiveness for ourselves and to be delivered. But we ought to be also, in our thanksgiving to God, focusing on Him as well. Let me give you an example of what a prayer of of thankfulness for being saved might look like with God as the subject, not ourselves. Psalm 40, verse 2. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. You see how in that psalm that God is the center of everything. We shouldn't be the center of our own prayers to the king of the universe. We ought to spend some time focused on him. I wish that that was the only place that I got hung up on this week. But as I continued reading through this prayer, as I was praying through what God had for me and for us in this, I got hung up on verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn from God's love for them. Now that is, in itself, a perfectly truthful prayer. The Bible talks all about this, that when we turn to other things, we are turning away from God's love, and we are missing the opportunity to be loved by him. But then Jonah goes on, and he talks about all the things he is going to do. Now, so far in this prayer, it's only been about him and God. So why this turn all of a sudden? Why is he now bringing up idolaters? If you were with us last week or you're familiar with the story, Jonah has been asked to go to the city of Nineveh, a place that undoubtedly Jonah would have identified as being full of idolaters, people who worshiped another god. That's why Jonah didn't want to go there. He didn't want to see God's grace on them. And I think that's the reason why he puts this in here. He's in competition in his mind, in his heart, with the Ninevites. He believes that, and I'm speculating here, but that if God blesses them and gives grace to them, then that somehow diminishes his place with God. We do this all the time. I had a friend in college who uh, told me that uh, he was in a blood feud with somebody. I was like, what? It's like, yeah, we're, I, I don't like them. We're in a blood feud. I said, did they know that they're in a blood feud? He goes, no, that's the beauty of the blood feud. They don't know that they're in it. And we do that all the time. We are in competition with people and we don't want them to be blessed because we somehow feel that that's going to diminish us. That somehow if somebody else is elevated, that we're being diminished. This might be a coworker that you're competing with for uh, the same promotion, or somebody in your family, a sibling. We do this all the time. I call it a covert competition because we know that we're in the competition with them, but they don't. And so we go around sneakily not blessing them. And actually this, this little break in Jonah's prayer reminds me a lot of uh, what of a parable that Jesus told in the book of Luke. Chapter 18, starting in verse 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness, that means they believed in their own ability to do the right thing and to be in right relationships, that they were getting it all right, and looked down on other people, which by the way, If you're looking down on people, then you're not in the right place in your relationships. But it's interesting how often those two things go together, aren't they? When we feel like we're doing everything right, that that puts us in a a position where we think that now we can look down on other people. Jesus told this parable. Two men went out to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, idolaters, 
or even like this tax collector or Republican or Democrat or whoever you dislike. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. God, I am doing everything right. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And while I could be misreading Jonah's intentions, I had to really pause and look at myself in this. Because our prayers are affected by the relationships that we are in. If we are not in a healthy position with somebody else, that affects our prayer life. That's why, that's why forgiveness is so important. Why choosing not to have enemies, even if people see us as enemies. That's why God is always calling us into relationships so that we can learn how to be in relationship with other people. And if we are in the place where, where we think that we don't need God's salvation as much as somebody else, that cheapens what God has done for us. And that is why I am so grateful that Jonah finishes on this note. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. I love the translations that say that salvation belongs to the Lord, that he is the only source of salvation, that it doesn't matter what we think about other people. It is up to him if they are saved or not. We may play a part in that. He may be sending us to go speak to some people that we don't like, to share his love, but we are not the ones that decide who gets saved. Worship team, you can come up. Salvation in the Hebrew is Yeshua. Directly translated into English, it's Joshua. Yahweh saves. But when you run it through the Greek in the New Testament, onto the Latin and then into English, we end up with Jesus. Jesus is salvation. And salvation comes through no one else except for Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, whether they're running from God or whether they're doing exactly what God says. No matter what you have done in your life, no matter what you feel is barring you from relationship, the invitation is open from Jesus to receive that salvation. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while and, and you've started heading in the wrong direction. Salvation is still for you. You can't out God's grace. Now that doesn't mean, and Paul makes this clear in the book of Romans, that doesn't mean that we go out and do whatever we want to. There's a new phrase that, or at least it's new to me, called building your testimony where people are going out and doing foolish things so that they can have a better testimony. That's unbelievable to me. There's some of you that have grown up in the church and for the most part you have done exactly what's expected of you. You followed Jesus from a young age and I can tell you I wish I had your testimony of believing in his faithfulness because I'm one of those foolish ones that ran the wrong way did all sorts of nonsense. And yet God in his mercy and grace has still chosen to save me. And for that, I will give him thanks for all eternity. Because he didn't leave me where he found me. He didn't leave me where my decisions were taking me. He saw fit to intervene in my life because he wanted be my father. Friends, adoption is open to anyone that will humble themselves 
and allow God to exalt them when the time is right. We've got one more song that Tim and the worship team are going to lead us through, and I just invite you to allow Jesus to speak to you as we sing.